Hello, once again, everyone, and welcome to the Pearls Lecture Series of 2023. Uh, my name is Bilal Hafiz. I am a 30 medical student with the University of Melbourne. Uh, and before we get started with our seventh lecture of the lecture series today, I wanted to quickly talk about Pearls as an organization. So Pearls stands for POCUS for emergency as well as acute care in resource limited settings. Uh, and our program actually started last year in August when the inaugural Pearls course took place in Port Vila, Vanuatu, where a team of Australian physicians and sonographers went down to Vanuatu uh, and undertook a three-day ultrasound training course for the physicians there, uh, where physicians uh, uh, learned uh, uh, ultrasound uh, imaging techniques using devices as well that they were able to use and plug into their smartphones. And since then, we've been able to have a constant communication with these uh, physicians, talking to them and having some feedback by remote imaging platforms as well. Uh, and the Pearls Lecture Series was put into place so that we can continue supporting physicians on the ground from resource limited settings uh, in their emergency and acute care health provisions. And since then, Pearls teams have traveled uh, additionally as well, uh, including Tonga. And we have Joel McCann with us in the audience today, who has recently uh, done some travels as well. So very exciting. Um, so today we'll have our seventh lecture focusing on ultrasound physics and artifacts for the clinician practitioner by Martin Nikas. Um, Martin, thank you so very much for coming by today and uh, giving us a presentation on such an important and different topic than what we're usually used to. Uh, now, before we get started, I thought it would be um, really good for our audience to have a quick understanding of what kind of got you into ultrasound imaging uh, as a clinician and what aspects of ultrasound uh, medicine specifically that you find uh, are very niche to you and something that you want to just share about the pearls of wisdom of what you've learned throughout uh, your years of practice. Hello, Bilal. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and, the, and a very gracious question. It's a big and loaded question. So I'm a practicing uh, specialist sonographer working at Waikato Hospital in New Zealand, and I've been uh, in clinical practice for about 27 years now. <clears throat> and what got me into ultrasound was a sheer uh, set of coincidences and an accident, but I've never regretted it. It is a tremendously interesting field. Uh, I always uh, like an ultrasound to a treasure hunt. Uh, it's exciting because you never know what you might, in, you, know, you know, unearth inside a patient. And so uh, I think it's the chase that uh, keeps me going. And uh, a pearl of wisdom to share perhaps would be learn everything. Uh, there is just no limit to the amount of knowledge you can amass about the human body, about uh, clinical medicine or about the applications of ultrasound. And so uh, you might never know when you can actually apply something you have uh, learned recently. And, you know, as long as I've been in clinical practice, every single day I learn something new and I, I marvel at the technology that's uh, now so readily available at our fingertips. Amazing. Thanks so much for that, Martin. That was amazing. Um, so whenever you're ready, please get started. Fabulous. Well, I hope that you can all see my screen and we can start straight away. Any of your questions, you're most welcome to put into the chat and I'll endeavor to answer it a little bit later on. So uh, ultrasound physics and artifacts is often a scary topic, but uh, you know it's an important topic uh, for every user of ultrasound. So in this presentation, we'll have a look at some of the fundamentals of ultrasound technology, explain some of the common artifacts, and also have a look at a series of artifacts that have caused diagnostic errors and how these could have been avoided. So first, let's uh, talk a little bit about ultrasound technology itself, because we need to understand the ultrasound technology in order to be able to uh, discuss artifacts in the first place. So really, it is essential we understand how ultrasound works, um, and this will allow us to optimize images, improve our diagnostic confidence, and maximize the diagnostic yield, and distinguish what's fact from an artifact. I do a lot of ultrasound teaching, and uh, sometimes I get uh, kind of hesitant responses from um, uh, learners of ultrasound about, oh, do I really need to know physics of ultrasound? Can I just put a probe on the patient and start scanning? You know, and that would be a, that would be a terrible disservice uh, to your patients because, as you can see in the example on the screen, you can get very different types of images if you just carelessly use ultrasound versus you. Um, actively optimize the image and take advantage of the ultrasound technology. Now, the next thing I wanted to kind of lead in with is that um, 
ultrasound artifacts affect all users of ultrasound, whether you have a small handheld system, medium level system, or high end system. No ultrasound system can effectively filter out all artifacts. Um, in fact, some of our highest and most sophisticated systems are prone to their own specific types of artifacts that arise when you use uh, a very high end technologies. And so there's really no ultrasound image that is artifact free. Almost everything you look at is artifactual. Um, sometimes it is just that artifacts are a nuisance, but sometimes they can be critically misleading and we need to know about them. Now, in terms of ultrasound transducers that you might be using in clinical practice, there are really two types of things that um, you might pick up. One, you might pick up a piezoelectric uh, crystal transducer, and those are the most commonly used uh, transducers pretty much by all of the leading manufacturers except your butterfly. So butterfly transducers are slightly different. Where piezoelectric transducers use ceramic type materials to produce sound, a butterfly device uses a capacitive membrane to produce sound, where basically a membrane is vibrating in response to electrical stimuli. Those two technologies both produce sound, but produce it in slightly different ways and produce it in slightly different frequency bands. So for example, a capacitive membrane has a much larger um, spectrum of frequencies capable of adapting the transducer to low frequency imaging, such as abdominal and cardiac, and high frequency imaging, such as superficial veins, whereas when you use piezoelectric transducers, you really need to have multiple devices for different uses. But piezoelectric transducers do have some advantages in terms of their power, in terms of their image quality as well. So it doesn't really matter which transducer you use. The transducer design that I'll talk about now is um, more pertaining to piezoelectric materials, but capacitive membranes are very, very similar. So a typical transducer contains a housing, which is the plastic cover that holds everything in. It's got electrical wiring. It's got a dense um, plastic material called the damping layer. And this damping layer provides pressure onto the transducer element to prevent them from ringing forever once they're excited by an electrical stimulus. And then you have a row of elements in case of piezoelectric transducers. These are made of uh, special types of ceramics on the surface of the transducer is a matching layer, which is a layer of um, uh, sort of rubbery plastic that allows you to transmit the sound into the patient in a smooth manner. And it also provides a little bit of electrical shielding of the patient. Typically a group of tra uh, transducer elements is all excited at the same time to produce one ultrasound beam that penetrates into the patient. And then this one beam will then create one scan line of information on the screen. So each vertical line on the ultrasound display represents one pulse and echo sequence going into the patient. And then we have a number of scan lines across the whole transducer. So if we have a look at the diagram on the right-hand side, a pulse is admitted into the patient. That pulse encounters a reflector and the reflector, a reflection occurs that returns back to the patient, but part of the pulse propagates until you encounter another echo, um, at which point the process repeats. Now, of course, as we go into the patient, we rapidly lose energy and this is attenuation. And um, this process takes place very rapidly because sound propagates through the human body at about a mile per second. So you can create hundreds of lines in a frame of ultrasound. The conventional way of doing ultrasound is literally stabbing the tissue with ultrasound beams line by line. And those beams are then fanning out of the transducer in case of a curvilinear transducer, as you can see on the image producing a fan-shaped uh, image. And now this process is very straightforward, uh, but it's, it is prone to many artifacts and a little bit of a speckly image, which is why traditionally ultrasound images were rather grainy. One of the more recent technologies that helps smooth images out is rather than emitting the beams into the patient in a straight manner, the beams can be steered at slightly um, 
at varying angles really uh, to the right and to the left upon transmission. And this gives you a lattice work of beams uh, that provides better border definition, smoother images. And really if this is a preferred mode of imaging on most transducers. This uh, technique is called spatial compounding. You can have uh, somewhere in between three and seven lines per transmitting aperture. And uh, the technology is often on by default. So as a user, if you just pick up a transducer from a, a system that's capable of spatial compounding, and even some of the low-end machines do this uh, for you automatically, and you select a preset for abdominal imaging, spatial compounding will already be on and active. And it provides those benefits of smoother image, better definition, um, and better lesion conspicuity as a consequence. Now let's talk a little bit about the characteristics of each ultrasound pulse, which will then create the pulse and echo sequence for each line of sight. Ultrasound pulses in B mode need to be kept short. They are about two to four wavelengths. And they have to be short because the axial resolution, the resolution of the pixels up and down in the display is related to the spatial pulse length. So on top of the slide, you have a diagram of what a typical ultrasound pulse would look like about three wavelengths in duration. And this gives you a short spatial pulse length. And it is this spatial pulse length that is related to axial resolution. The shorter the pulse, the better the resolution. Um, you can only emit a new pulse into the patient once you've gathered all the echoes from the deepest portion of the image. Otherwise, the two pulses would become mixed and the system would have no way of knowing which echo came from which um, uh, transmission. And as a consequence, there is a time limit to how many pulses you can transmit into the patient um, or how frequently you can do it and the frequency with which you can emit new pulses into the patient having gathered echoes from the deepest portion of the preceding pulse is called the pulse repetition frequency. And this obviously is uh, depth setting dependent. Now let's briefly talk about acoustic impedance because it is one of the fundamental variables, acoustic variables uh, that determines reflectivity. So uh, impedance is simply a product of the tissue density and compressibility. And it so happens that the greater the difference in acoustic impedance of two adjacent tissues, the greater the reflection is going to be. If there's no acoustic impedance mismatch, this means that no echo will be generated and this will not be an, um, an acoustic boundary, even though it can be an optical boundary. Um, and one of the experiments that I sometimes have done with students is to fill a glass with ultrasound gel, which is slightly tinted. My, um, uh, some of the aquasonic gels are slightly bluish or greenish tinge. And then top it off with water. And you can see that you have a sort of a tequila sunrise arrangement in the glass. You have a colored gel and then you have some uh, water on top. But if you place a transducer into it and try to image the boundary, there is no boundary. And that's because water and gel have such similar acoustic impedance that there is no echo generated uh, at a boundary and the boundary is not visible. In contrast, very high acoustic impedance mismatch can be found between uh, objects such as soft tissue and bone or soft tissue and gas. And this will produce a very high reflectivity and a very bright echo. Um, as you can see in this example of a patient with a polymicrobial scrotal abscess of four years gangrene, where there is a, a lot of echogenicities along the scrotal wall. And the, this is gas from gas producing organisms and infection. So sometimes understanding even the characteristics of reflectivity can help you determine what tissues you're looking at. Now, the way that uh, sound waves interact with soft tissue uh, can be quite complex, and there are several options. The vast majority of tissue interfaces are scatterers, in that the beam hits the object, and then you get a hemispherical reflection back towards the transducer, and this hemispherical reflection propagates until it reaches the transducer. So the vast majority of soft tissue targets that we image routinely with ultrasound including the soft tissue texture that you see related to the liver and kidney is related to 
um, scattering a reflection. Some interfaces, which are very smooth, very straight, and very reflective, like a polished mirror, are mirror um, uh, interfaces. These are called specular, reflected, uh, specular reflectors, and they do act as acoustic mirrors, very much the same as an optical mirror uh, does. The optical mirror reflects the world that's in front of it, and an acoustic mirror does exactly the same. And as a consequence, acoustic mirrors cause mirror image artifacts. A final way of uh, interacting uh, with an interface may be uh, a refraction. And refraction is a scenario where we have a tissue boundary that's non-perpendicular to the beam. And we have a difference in velocities of the, the propagation velocities of the tissue above and below the boundary. If there's a difference in velocity, the beam will tend to bend according to Snell's law, and the bending will uh, be away from the propagating beam if the velocity is faster. So in this diagram, the velocity V2 is faster than V1, and the bending will be the opposite if the propagation speed is slower in the second, uh, second beam. I will show you some examples where refraction artifacts can be seen and where they can uh, cause duplication of objects under specific circumstances. Attenuation is um, uh, another important characteristic of propagating beams and that this pertains to the loss of intensity as the beam propagates through the soft tissue. Where does the energy go? Well, uh, some of it, uh, some of attenuation is related to reflection, some to refraction and some to absorption of the mechanical energy of the ultrasound beam in the soft tissue, and this is converted to heat, which is why heating is an important consideration when we image um, a human pregnancy, in particular in adults. It doesn't matter so much because the heating is quite minimal, and adult tissues are very uh, well resistant to small fluctuations in temperature, but this might not be the case during embryogenesis, so we need to be mindful of heating um, when we image uh, human pregnancy, particularly early on. Soft tissues attenuate, sorry, some tissues attenuate more than others. For example, soft tissue attenuates less than bone. Um, fatty liver will attenuate more than normal liver and so on. Attenuation is frequency related. The higher the frequency, the higher the attenuation. So we have some low attenuation structures and these make very good acoustic windows. And these are organs that are easy to examine. For example, no normal liver, normal subcutaneous fat, any fluid fill structures, mucosal interfaces, and even empty gut is very low attenuating. And we recognize that there are some high attenuating structures. I've already mentioned fatty liver or liver with NASH or cirrhosis. Anything that's edematous uh, will become generally higher attenuating. Any hard connective tissues, fibrous tissues, cartilage, bone. Um, abdominal wall is relatively higher attenuating compared to, for example, mucosal interfaces um, in endocavitary scanning. And uh, bowel gas is also highly attenuating, and these attenuation um, scenarios create specific artifacts, and that's usually dropout and shadowing. So you can see that this example of fatty liver, how the liver is inhomogeneously uh, transmitting, and even a change in time gain compensation, which is what uh, each one of you who's a practicing uh, clinician sono sonologist would want to reach for time gain compensation, might be insufficient to counteract attenuation. And of course, the attenuation is then related to system uh, ability to penetrate into the patient. So that brings us to penetration, which is closely related. Um, if we needed more penetration, there is several options that we have. One is to try to get closer to the object of interest or find a, a better acoustic window that's less attenuating or that gets us there at a shorter distance. Or alternately, we might need to counteract attenuation by the use of lower frequency transducers if you have the luxury to do so. Or perhaps you might have an instrument that is uh, multi-frequency capable, in which case you 
continue to use your instrument, but just use a lower frequency option. And that may sometimes uh, sort of save the day. For example, in this patient with an attenuating liver, as you see in the picture on the left, there is uncertainty as to whether the liver is normal in the deeper parts of the image, but with a reduction of transducer frequency, you can be very confident that you are seeing down to the bottom of the liver and there is no mass. Let's briefly talk about resolution because this is important when we talk about certain artifacts. So resolution really pertains to the image quality and um, there are a number of aspects to it. First is spatial resolution. So spatial resolution um, is simply concerned about the resolution of two closely adjacent targets within soft tissue. It could be that uh, we want to distinguish two targets closely related up and down, and that is axial resolution. And this is frequency related resolution. The better the, um, the higher the frequency of the transducer, the better the resolution along the axis. Then we have lateral resolution, which is side by side resolution. And so um, uh, this is the ability of the system to distinguish two closely adjacent reflectors side by side. This is also frequency related, but it's also related to things such as focusing. And then we have elevational resolution, and that's really slice thickness. We sometimes think about an ultrasound display as an infinitely thin slice of the patient's anatomy, but that's certainly not the case. In fact, we're looking at quite a chunky slice. And even in the elevation, that is the thickness plane of the instrument, the image has to be focused somehow. And uh, if you look closely, some of your transducers demonstrate a little ridge along the length of the array. And that's because there's an acoustic lens that's been glued to the length of the array to provide you with focusing in the thickness plane of the image. In practice, resolution is, um, is all the rage. It makes a huge difference in assessing a patient. Here are some examples of just theoretical phantom being scanned by a wide variety of transducers. You can see that at 10 megahertz, we have clear visualization of soft tissue targets, very crisp and clear images. But step down to 4 megahertz, which is still quite a reasonable frequency, and suddenly our boundaries are fuzzy and the internal amount of fluid is much reduced. And that's because the boundaries of the um, fluid are thicker. And then if we go to two megahertz array, now you can't really distinguish those two targets as two objects. It's just one fuzzy object. And whether fluid exists here or not is anybody's guess. And this is just a nice demonstration of how the use of different transducers creates visually very striking differences in image quality. Now, let's briefly talk about um, uh, reflectivity of soft tissues. I've already hinted at the fact that the uh, reflectivity is related to differences in acoustic impedance, but it's also uh, related to the angle at which we strike the reflector. So different objects may appear, in fact, very different at different angles. And this is one of the painful points of ultrasound. Uh, compared to, for example, CT scan. So a CT scan is a very isovolumetric technique. On a CT scan, a point of information really is just a sugar cube of data that's very isovolumetric from all sides. It's very, very uniform. But on ultrasound, that does not happen. On ultrasound, our pixels are more like tiles. They are very thin up and down. They are wide to the side, and they're also quite deep. Um, so we need to be mindful of that. And the strongest and best reflection and the best visualization is when the ultrasound beam and the object we're looking at are perpendicular to each other. And this is called normal incidence. For those of you who engage in um, uh, ultrasound guided IV access or any interventional procedures such as uh, abscess drainage, you will know this from clinical experience. If you are trying to reach a soft tissue target with a very steep angulation of the needle, you often can't see the needle at all the more shallow the approach to the skin that is more acute to skin, the more perpendicular to the ultrasound beam, the better the visualization of the needle. But unfortunately, that might not always be possible for you to perform guidance into a deep object at a very um, acute angle uh, to the skin. And that's because the needle will have to be very, very long. So uh, it's important to be mindful of this relationship of angle 
and reflectivity. Now, why is resolution so important? Well, um, the better the resolution, the better your visualization. And the better you can see things, the better your diagnostic confidence. Here's a simple example of uh, a patient with multiple splenic masses. You can see on the left side of the image, this is done with a conventional curvilinear transducer, and the spleen looks relatively normal. We don't see anything interesting. There's a bit of a bulky pancreas, needs assessment there, but the spleen, reasonably okay. But with a high-frequency transducer of the same spleen, we have better spatial resolution. We therefore have better contrast resolution. And suddenly you can see that the texture of the organ is much different. Uh, and there are multiple masses within the organ. This is one of the problems with ultrasound in that the instrumentation does make a big difference in terms of our visualization, our image quality. Some of you may be working in a low resource setting where you're using ultrasound to make big calls. Um, it's a simple triage sort of procedure. And ultrasound, I think, shines in that setting. But some of you might also be working in settings where you're doing more detailed examinations. And if you have the ability to use different instruments, do it because it will surprise you um, just how much more uh, information you can obtain from the image. But I'll return to the low resource settings because this is what the presentation is all about. And I would like to say that, look, ultrasound probably works like the rest of the universe on the basis of the 80-20 um, rule, where 80% of the results is obtained with 20% of the effort. And the rest of the 20% of the results takes all the rest of the effort. So I think you can do a lot uh, with uh, relatively simple devices as long as uh, you are a good observer. Now, in terms of resolution, let's just return back to that briefly. We've, we've spoken about spatial resolution, but there's also contrast resolution. And the contrast resolution is that ability of the system to show you um, slightly different tissues in sufficiently different echo texture so you can pick it up. And there was a nice example we've just seen. And there's also temporal resolution. And temporal resolution is the ability of the machine to demonstrate to you things that are happening in real time at the correct time. Uh, you may experience, for example, a patient who uh, is moving, maybe they're Parkinsonian, maybe there's uh, some tissue movement, maybe they're just crying or breathing heavily. And you can see that um, in those images, there is a loss of image quality. They may be smeared. And this is due to uh, temporal resolution limitations. Finally, elevation resolution is the slice thickness of the beam. It's not a thin credit card image. It really is a chunky slice. So some anatomy may be averaged into the machine uh, in a way that is unpredictable or in a way that you do not want. Perhaps but the best example for clinicians is if you're performing guidance into a small vessel in a longitudinal section, uh, the vessel may be contaminated with echoes from behind and in front of the structure. It may be difficult to see small vessels. And this is due to a slight thickness artifact. And while the transducer is mechanically focused, if the beam thickness is um, greater than the distance between the two adjacent objects, they will not be resolved uh, as one. So it might be that there is fat behind the vessel and the vessel itself, and they will all be averaged into that one ultrasound slice. So temporal resolution really pertains to your ability to see things in real time, which in B mode, we don't tend to struggle so much. It is time dependent because you need high PRF for high um, uh, image frame rate. So the deeper you go, the slower the system is going to be. And in a patient who cannot stop their movement, for example, uh, you might be stuck having images that are blurry where there's a temporal, uh, a temporal issue with the display. You can see an example of that below. There are some things you can do about that on some systems. For example, you may be able to reduce the width of the display or reduce the line density of the display. These are features that are coming on board um, smaller systems as well, not just for high-end machines, and that might uh, sufficiently counteract the temporal resolution problems. So now that we have a good little overview and a refresher on physics of ultrasound, let's talk a little bit about artifacts. So first of all, artifact is uh, 
usually due to the fact that ultrasound and soft tissue behaves in unpredictable ways. And so what you see on the display is what the machine really is getting from the patient, but it might not represent a reality. Um, most artifacts will just be a nuisance, but some artifacts are misleading and it can lead to an incorrect diagnosis. And in some instances, we've actually taken advantage of artifacts and harnessed the power of them pretty much in lung imaging uh, with any structures uh, that are shadowing. We know that uh, relative high density and so on. There are many um, misconceptions that the machine may have about how uh, sound is propagating in the, in the human body and how it's interacting with soft tissue. So I'll tell you some of the assumptions that every ultrasound machine must make in order to be able to operate. So these are assumptions that the system has, but they might not necessarily be true all the time. So one assumption is that ultrasound pulse travels in a straight line and that echoes follow that straight path back. This is generally true, but it's not true when there's refraction in the image. The speed of sound in the body is constant. It's not really true. There are variations of about 10%, and this is sufficient to create artifacts. Assumption that attenuation is uniform and predictable is also not true. For example, scanning a liver through a, a muscular abdominal wall, the muscle will have higher propagation speed than the liver, and the attenuation also will be different. That two comparable soft tissue reflectors at the same location will, uh, will generate a comparable echo is also not necessarily true, depends on the tissue above it. Uh, that the beam dimensions are small in height, width, and thickness is definitely not true on ultrasound. It's not isovolumetric, but the machine in order to make basic calculations about echolocation has to make that assumption. Another, uh, another assumption is that echoes originate only from the central axis of the beam, not from outside. Um, and that assumption is broken with, for example, side lobe artifacts. That each reflector only generates one echo will be lovely. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Um, in reverberation, we might have uh, two adjacent echoes that produce many, uh, so two uh, adjacent reflectors that create many echoes. Another assumption is that the arriving echo was generated by the last transmitted echo pulse. We have to make that assumption not always true. The assumption that the rate of ultrasound acquisition exceeds the rate of physiologic events is not true sometimes with temporal resolution issues. And there's also assumptions that the system makes that you as the operator are actually using the machine appropriately. And um, uh, that certainly may not be true. Uh, operators might be doing crazy and unpredictable things. So perhaps the operator is in, still in training and by the action and the use of the system, they will be creating artifacts. And uh, the system also assumes that you as the operator have tweaked every button correctly and this is the best that you can get. And that certainly uh, may not be true all the time. And finally, there is assumption that everything is working correctly, that the transducer, cable, all connections are working, that the system is well shielded from surrounding electrical noise, and that might certainly not be the case, particularly small ultrasound machines are prone to these kind of problems, such as electrical interference, because it's just a small box. And so you've got an air conditioning unit next door that has powerful uh, radio frequency and noise, the system may be affected by that as well. So these are some of the key assumptions that the ultrasound machine may make about the propagation of sound and soft tissue that may not always be true, and this will lead to artifacts. So the first group of artifacts we'll have a look at is beam with artifacts. And these originate from the dimensions of each pixel of information representing one echo. And I've already sort of hinted at the fact that ultrasound is not isovolumetric. We're looking at tiles, not sugar cubes of information. This is actually a very, very important point because axial resolution, as you know from reflectivity already, is always best at perpendicular uh, and is pretty shocking actually at any other angles than at normal incidence. Here's a good example. For example, um, if we're looking at a bile duct, uh, it's absolutely key that we orientate the image in such a way that the bile duct is perpendicular to the image. In that case, we see it really well. 
in patients where that might not be possible or where the operator is struggling to obtain it at 90 degrees, even at a 45 degree angle, we will not see a bile duct at all because the whereas the pixels are little tiles on the perpendicular approach, and it just so happens we're taking advantage of axial resolution, which is really high. In the case where we're approaching the bile duct diagonally, those echoes will be smeared across the lumen of the bile duct, creating a fuzzy appearance and preventing us from visualizing it. So any small structures, whether it's ducts, vessels, nuchal translucency, um, anything small should be approached at 90 degrees. Axial resolution is always the best. Another beam with artifact is slice thickness. You can see a beautiful example of it in this uh, uh, example of a vessel that is perfectly healthy and patent, but it's just changing in diameter. This is a small saphenous vein, I think, from a patient. Now, it could be that you're trying to cannulate a vessel somewhere in the forearm. The vessel just happens to change in diameter. You can see that at a point one, uh, you would not struggle to cannulate that. It's really easy. But at point two, the vessel is very fuzzy. Uh, and it appears to be contaminated with echoes. And that is because the slice thickness, that is the depth of the image in the elevation plane, um, is larger than the diameter of the blood vessel. And so the surrounding fat from behind and in front of the vessel is all captured in the image. This is a very difficult artifact to, uh, to counteract. And one of the best ways you can do it is to confirm that uh, this is a patent vessel in transverse section with compression. And if you are desperate and you're guiding into a small vessel or you're guiding into a decent vessel, but with a poor instrument, then transverse section would have less of this artifact in it. Um, so that's one of your options. Or the other option is to uh, give it a go and use your clinical skills in combination with the ultrasound to um, cannulate the vessel. Uh, let's have a look at acoustic shadowing, which is an attenuation artifact. Uh, this is a very, very common and known artifact, so I'm not going to go too much into it. Basically, with acoustic shadowing, it can be complete, such as in the case of gallstones, and you can see them nicely raining shadows down. Uh, or it could just be fuzzy uh, shadow. It could be partial, complete. Um, and it depends on the degree of attenuation that the structure is offering. Uh, sometimes this incomplete shadowing is also referred to as dirty shadowing. The typical structures that demonstrate shadowing are anything dense, such as bone, anything highly reflective, such as gas, and calculi as well. Now, it could be that... Um, Shadowing is an important diagnostic criterion for a certain structure, such as a gallstone or a kidney stone, and you want to accentuate that. In that case, it's very important to reduce your spatial compounding or turn it off, because with spatial compounding, um, due to the different arrangement of beams coming across the image, you may be writing information where there should be an acoustic shadow. So that's a good little teaching point. Acoustic shadowing, of course, is dependent on the size of the object and the beam width. So in this case of a gallbladder with some gravel in it, it's uncertain as to whether this is just a collection of dense sludge or cholesterol crystals or whether these, in fact, are discrete calculi. You can see we're using curvilinear transducer to do this examination. This might be, for example, a 5C1 transducer which has a lower spatial resolution, both axial and lateral. If we switch to a higher frequency transducer, so in this case, we have uh, switched to something like a um, four megahertz linear, you can see now that because this transducer has um, less divergence, perhaps a better frequency range, we can now distinguish each individual calculus and behind each individual calculus, we can definitely see an acoustic shadow. That might be a very useful thing for you to know uh, whether a patient has just sludge or whether these are discrete calcula or biliary sand, because of course, these are the exact type stones that tend to jump out of the gallbladder and cause obstruction of the bile duct and pancreatitis. Another type of shadowing is seen on the edges of rounded structures. They can be edges of solid structures, 
cystic structures, or even vessels, and this is edge shadowing. With edge shadowing, uh, the ultrasound sunbeam is really just shading the very edge of that causative structure, and there are two things that happen here. One is because that beam is propagating at a very acute angle to the boundary of the object, you may get total uh, critical reflection with the beam deflecting away and defocusing, or you may also have penetration, but with refraction causing defocusing. And so the, the effect of those two, the critical angle and the refraction results in an unsightly shadow propagating away from the structure. It could be sometimes that these shadows are quite pronounced and they're obstructing your view of deeper structures, in which case you need to simply walk away from the structure, walk around it uh, in order to see the tissues that you're interrogating. Now, uh, in contrast to attenuation uh, and shadowing, we have acoustic enhancement, which is really a low attenuation problem. So uh, in the examples that you see, we have an, a liver that has homogeneous attenuation. Then there is an object embedded in it. In one example, it is a simple cyst. In the other example, it's actually solid mass. But it so happens that the attenuation within the inside of these masses is less than the surrounding liver. So when the beam hits the back boundary of the object, it is stronger than in the adjacent uh, liver, and therefore it will uh, create echoes of greater amplitude, and this will be brighter on the display. And that is the principle of acoustic enhancement. There is this misconception that uh, enhancement means that the object is fluid filled, but that is not the case. The enhancement simply means that the internal echo characteristics of the lesion uh, allow lower attenuation than the surroundings. So in the top example, we do have a fluid field object with embedded within a normal liver, and that's just a simple cyst. But in the um, example below, we have a solid liver mass. Now, luckily for the patient, in this case, it is a hemangioma. But this hemangioma is buried in the liver on the background of focal fatty change. And so in this case, the hemangioma is lower attenuating than the surrounding liver and is therefore associated with an enhancement artifact. So whilst enhancement artifact is often associated with fluid, it's not always the case and we cannot rely on it to tell whether a structure is or is not fluid filled. Another annoying artifact is reverberation and um, this breaks the assumption that each structure will only generate one echo. You see reverberation uh, uh, particularly strongly in fluid-filled structures where there are linear interfaces above the um, artifact. And these linear interfaces effectively trap uh, sound and allow the sound to go back and forth between these interfaces. The um, this sound that's trapped and bouncing back and forth between these linear uh, interfaces produces echoes in each time that it is reflected. And those echoes are then shown deeper and deeper in the display because they're arriving back to the transducer at deeper and deeper or later and later times. Um, time, of course, is represented as depth on the ultrasound image. So that is the principle of the artifact because the uh, repetitive uh, bouncing of the sound up and down uh, results in intensity loss of the beam. You can see that uh, the reverberation artifact is getting weaker and weaker as the, um, as the beam propagates, really, uh, until a point is reached where the reverberation is not seen at all. And so that's classic of reverberation. It tends to contaminate the leading edge of uh, fluid-filled structures, but of course it does that to solid organs as well, except 
that it is not so apparent. But uh, those of you who are experienced with liver imaging and may have seen liver masses, you'll know that a comparable mass is much harder to see on the top of the image than somewhere in the center of the image. And that's because the top of the image is contaminated with reverberation and it reduces your contrast resolution up there. But you may be unaware of it because the reverberation happens to be a very similar uh, echo texture to that of the liver. So the typical reverberating structures uh, can be the body wall, and that's usually the case. It could be that there's gas uh, at the lung surface, gas in bowel, and needles also tend to reverberate quite nicely. You can sometimes reduce this artifact uh, quite effectively by rocking the transducer uh, on the patient and getting away from this uh, 90 degree approach. Whilst we often want normal incidence. We want this 90 degree approach. In case of reverberation, it really ruins your images. And so reducing the pressure, allowing the tissues to fan out and expand helps. Also changing the angle in the scan plane as well as the elevation plane uh, may help. And the use of tissue harmonic imaging, which if your system is capable of it, should be um, turned on as a default anyway. Now, comet tail artifacts, which are uh, commonly seen in uh, cholesterosis of the gallbladder with surgical devices, uh, sometimes with gas. Um, they are really a, just a short distance reverberation artifact. So they occur in exactly the same way a reverberation does, except that they are focal. And that's because there's usually two closely spaced objects. They are relatively small. It could be a surgical clip. It could be a cholesterol crystals. It could be other things in the soft tissue. Now compare that with a ring down artifacts. So I'll just go back uh, for one second. If you anchor your site on cometal artifact, you can see that the artifact has a short distance duration. That means it's a short temporal uh, duration. The artifact lasts only a short time. Whereas ring down artifact tends to last a long time. And for that reason, ring down artifact is seen as a artifact that uh, propagates to the very bottom part of the image. And that tells you a little bit about the characteristic of the structure that's causing this. This structure has to be elastic and it has to be um, producing echoes continuously once excited. And generally the only thing that does that is gas. On occasion, metal will do that as well, where you excite the object much like a tuning fork and the tuning fork then rings back to the ultrasound uh, for the entire duration that uh, the um, image is being interrogated. Um, the ring down is actually very helpful because if you find this in the liver, you know that you have gas in the liver. If you have a patient who's had a sphincterotomy or some sort of uh, biliary problems, chances are this is going to be pneumobilia. But it could also be that you have an incredibly sick and septic patient um, who uh, may have portovenous gas. In soft tissues, finding uh, of for gas is very concerning because it usually means that there are gas producing organisms and you may be dealing with an abscess or alternatively, you might have gas in soft tissues because of trauma, such as uh, shear trauma injury or introduced gas from, from penetrating trauma. If you find gas in the bladder, the most common place it gets there is through catheterization. Um, but it can also be there because of um, emphysematous, emphysematous uh, urinary tract infection. So uh, knowing about the presence of gas can be clinically very, very useful. A completely different class of artifacts is refraction artifacts, which occur due to bending of the ultrasound beam. And they produce these puzzling appearances where you may have duplications of uh, objects and the classic one is a duplication of a gestational sac where it looks like twins um, whereas you only really have one in this example which is one of the best examples I have in my teaching library you just have a duplication of a yolk sac now this is a this is not a monochorionic diamniotic pregnancy as the top image would tend to suggest this really is a singleton pregnancy uh, and the image below is taken from the same patient. So um, how does this happen? So uh, refraction happens because there's a propagation speed difference of the tissues above uh, the target structure, in this case, the gestational sac. 
And um, there's a very unique arrangement in the abdominal wall where you have two rectus abdominis muscles that are closely spaced together. But these rectus abdominis muscles are in the shape of a lens. And so it is the lens shape of these muscles that tends to bend the ultrasound beam in such a way that the same object inside the patient can be looked at twice uh, by beams uh, on one side, or other side of the linear alba, creating a duplication artifact. So this kind of side-by-side -side duplication is always refraction. It's called refraction ghosting because it creates a ghost image, um, an image of an object that shouldn't be there. You can get widening object of objects, for example, widening of the abdominal aorta. You can get duplication of objects, such as in this example, or triplication of objects if the beam is looking through the linear alba, as well as through each rectus abdominis muscle at one target, then that target will be in triplicate because the ultrasound machine, of course, always assumes that the echo has uh, come from the straight line of propagation and that will be here. That's where it's going to be plotted and on the other side as well. So the assumption that refraction breaks is the assumption that the beam is pro propagating straight. Um, into the patient. This is a very easy artifact to uh, avoid if it's causing you a nuisance. And that is um, all you need to do is slide to one side uh, laterally uh, because uh, if you're scanning through just one rectus abdominis muscle, then it doesn't matter that there's refraction in the image. You can never get duplication. You will only get duplication from refraction if you're scanning through the midline. And for this reason, also refraction ghosting is not known anywhere else in the human body because nowhere else do we have the arrangement of these lens-shaped two adjacent muscles. Now, refraction itself does happen in plenty of places, but it's not visible to you as the operator because you do not know that the tissue you're looking at are uniformly displaced uh, to one side or another. Here is a video clip. Those of you who have a good internet connection can see it in real time. For some of you, this might play very slowly, but here is a refraction ghosting of hepatic veins. You can see the hepatic veins in duplicate, and you can also sh see that the ghost is slightly shimmery, and that's due to temporal uh, issues related to spatial company. But a lovely example of refraction ghosting. Now, mirror images are very different to refraction, even though they do result in duplication of the object. So with the mirror image, the mechanism is that we have a smooth and large, highly reflective surface, uh, and this surface acts as an acoustic mirror. The typical structures that cause this is a pleural gas interface in the lung, um, in the diaphragm, so uh, mirror image of the liver, for example, or kidney is very common. But also you can get that at the apex. So for those of you doing uh, perhaps nerve blocks or who are looking at subclavian vessels, you get duplication of vessels up there as well. Any flat sections of long bones, such as in the shin, may also produce this uh, artifact, as well as uh, bowel gas, provided it is in a part of the uh, bowel that's nicely distended and it is flat and produces a sheet of gas. Um, in that case, you can see mirror image artifacts. You can uh, reduce or eliminate this artifact by simply avoiding looking at the mirror. Uh, by going to a different location and so on. Sometimes mirror image artifacts are actually very annoying because you can have um, the demonstration of, for example, pelvic mass uh, behind the bladder. Uh, so we have to have, be a little bit clever about recognizing whether the artifact uh, is present or whether this is real pathology. In uh, the example on the left, it's very easy to tell that this is a mirror image artifact because we have a diaphragm, we have a liver, we have a kidney, and then we have a kidney in the chest. Okay, it's not possible. But there's another reason that you know this is an artifactual. Um, the reason is that you see the psoas muscle and then body wall behind the real kidney, but there is no body wall in the chest. The chest just tends to, the, forgive me, I'll just go back to the slide. The chest simply tends to go on and on forever and ever and ever. 
uh, and this is simply impossible. There should be body wall, perhaps with ribs, and that gives you a very good clue that you're transmitting through the contents of the chest and you're not dealing with an artifact. In this case, it's artifactual, it's very easy to determine. But uh, in the case of the child on the right, we're scanning the bladder and then we're scanning uh, the rectum, which is gas filled. And you can see that because the rectum is curved and it's curved quite tightly, it's creating a convex mirror, which distorts the bladder and compresses it down into an apparent cystic structure in the pelvis. So for novice operators, it would be quite easy to think that perhaps there is either bowel distension or there could be a pelvic mass. Uh, I've seen this mistake having been made before. Uh, this is a nice uh, image that shows a real um, consolidation of the lung, a hepatization pattern. And you can tell uh, exactly what I was describing, that we have a liver with a body wall, some ribs with shadows. And then as we go into the chest, we have another rib, shadow. So the presence of these ribs and shadows tells you we are through transmitting. This is not a mirror image artifact. It's a real pathology. Above the diaphragm, we have a little bit of fluid. And then we have consolidated lung that just happens to look exactly the same as the liver, which is why we use the term hepatization pattern to describe that. A specific instance. A side lobe artifact is an easy artifact to recognize because it creates these large sweeping um, echoes across the image. It's very pronounced and very annoying. The principle of it is that um, adjacent to the main ultrasound beam are weaker uh, beams that are called side lobes. These are weaker regions of energy that are always there during beam formation that it's impossible to eliminate. And usually they are so weak that if they pick up a reflector, that reflector is not displayed. But on occasion, if there's something very bright sitting inside one of the side lobes, that echo will come back to the transducer. It will be sufficiently strong to be registered and the machine will assume it's come from the center of the beam. And so it will plot it there. Um, you can see in this example of the gallbladder, a big sweeping artifact is due to this bowel gas in the adjacent duodenum. You can also see how the operator eliminated the artifact by simply changing the angle uh, of interrogation so that the duodenum is now on the bottom of the image. Now the duodenum still has the uh, side lobe artifact uh, associated with it, but now that artifact is not contaminating the structure that you need to have a look at. So remember, sweeping bands are side lobes. Uh, they can be eliminated by change of angle of approach. Now, let me show you a couple of cases where the failure to recognize an artifact has really made a difference, and uh, it's usually a negative difference. It's a mistake, and sometimes it has uh, consequences. So. Here is a case uh, that I was asked to review from uh, another hospital. Um, here, a child presented with some abdominal pain to the emergency room and an abdominal ultrasound was ordered because that is the best test to triage uh, children with abdominal pain. The sonographer and the radiologist diagnosed an uh, aortic dissection. Both experts agreed that this is dissection. The child then was uh, rushed to CT. Uh, and received a contrast CT, not only with a contrast injection, but a significant radiation dose, and the CT is completely normal. Uh, and uh, the parents uh, raised a complaint about the case, which is how I got to know about it and analyze it. Um, looking at the B-mode image, you can see that um, there is an apparent soft tissue flap within the aorta. But let's just consider the clinical context for a moment as well. This is a child who presents with abdominal pain. What are the, you know, there's no context of trauma, connective tissue disorder. This is not a Marfan's kid. You know, what are the chances that some outpatient will walk in with aortic dissection and it's a child? I mean, it's just in incredibly uncommon. What's happening um, in this case is that there is an artifact inside the aorta. The artifact is a mirror image of the 
uh, wall of the superior mesenteric artery, if you look at the anatomy, we have aorta uh, coming up to superior mesenteric artery, and this is the aorta continuing. The walls of the superior mesenteric artery are incredibly bright, and as such, they um, uh, present very strong reflectors. So it is simply the case that the anterior wall of the SMA is being projected into the aorta across the posterior wall of the SMA acting as an acoustic mirror. So we have a mirror uh, scenario uh, causing this appearance. It's actually very common. It's very easy to reproduce this in uh, lean subjects. And it is perhaps that the radiologist and sonographer who performed the initial investigation have never really seen this or paid any attention to it. How could they have eliminated this grievous error and prevented uh, radiation exposure to this child? Very, very simply uh, by walking only a few millimeters away from the SMA and imaging from a different angle or perhaps using a decubitus window uh, that would have made the object disappear. And another way, of course, is with the use of color Doppler ultrasound, uh, because that would have shown no flow changes in the aorta, whereas with a large dissection like this, particularly at a diagonal angle, you would expect to see flow disturbance and turbulence. So uh, it's a, you can see, relatively easy mistake to make, even for uh, astute users of ultrasound. Here's another case. Um, uh, this case uh, surrounds color Doppler, and, and I didn't really go into color Doppler artifacts because I recognize that some of you might not even be using color Doppler devices, but it is a good example, so I'll put it in here. Um, here's a patient who comes for a gallbladder investigation, and um, the sonographer and radiologist diagnosed a vascularized gallbladder tumor because the gallbladder is completely echo-filled and we have a scatter of color Doppler signal within the lumen of the gallbladder. And as with the previous case, a CT was ordered, performed, it was normal. To add insult to injury, the patient was uninsured and had to pay for the CT scan that showed nothing. So in this case, we're dealing with a very common color Doppler artifact called twinkle. Twinkle occurs when we have um, any irregular surfaces within the ultrasound beam. Uh, it could be, uh, in this case, a scatter of cholesterol crystals. It could be a kidney stone and a variety of other structures, such as irregular plaque and vessels, will also create twinkle artifact. It's a well-recognized artifact. One of the ways that you can uh, uh, probably separate it from reality is to perform spectral Doppler and see if you can get recognizable waveforms within the artifact, which in this case would be impossible. And it's an easy uh, and avoidable mistake. Uh, this is a case that we did uh, not long ago at Waikato Hospital. Um, it's a child with, with a bump on the head after delivery. It's a classic cephalohematoma where uh, the um, uh, a periosteum has nicely peeled off from the skull and then there is blood underneath. But um, whilst the sonographer has completed the examination without any concern, the radiologist asked the sonographer to investigate the baby's brain because there's also... Uh, some sort of a, a fluid density underneath the skull here. Um, as expected, the brain examination is completely normal. And what we're looking at here is not some sort of a subdural collection in this child. What we're seeing is a mirror image artifact of the fluid from the kephalic hematoma being projected uh, into the inside of the skull. And that's because the skull in this case is a smooth large refractor and acts as an acoustic mirror. So what's happening is the initial beam is transmitted to the patient. The beam finds the edge of the skull correctly, echoes from the skull return back to the transducer, everything is fine. But at the same time, at the skull interface, the beam does not penetrate into the patient, but reflects um, somewhere else according to the rule of angle of uh, incidence equals rate, angle of reflection, that beam then propagates through the fluid, uh, through the cephalic hematoma, until it finds the skin surface. And that skin surface echo will then 
propagate back towards the transducer across the skull again and up. Uh, so this has taken a long time for this echo to return to the transducer machine that echoes that come from a deeper, deeper structure and that echo has been placed on the bottom of the image. This surface represents the surface of the transducer or the skin. So this is a simple case of a mirror image uh, artifact and the uh, transcranial ultrasound shows that that is the case. In this patient, we have a, a urinary bladder in transverse section. Um, there is all this nasty reverberation, attenuating artifact leading to shadowing. And um, one of my uh, one of my trainees scanned this patient, and I said, "Look, um, why can't you assist the bladder properly?" And they said, "Oh, there's overlying bowel gas." But you can tell from the anatomy, this is not overlying bowel gas because the bladder wall and mucosa is very easily recognizable. And if you closely have a look at it, you can see that there's a darker zone within it. And that darker zone is the muscular layer of the bladder wall. And that darker zone continues nicely on top of that artifact. So uh, this is a luminal problem, not an extrinsic a problem to the bladder. This, of course, is just gas within the bladder that's causing reverberation and attenuation of the beam with dirty shadowing. Uh, and it is absolutely possible to examine this part of the bladder. For example, in someone with hematuria, you could determine whether there is a bladder lesion or not by simply rolling the patient on their side so that the gas then moves up into the uh, less gravity dependent position uh, and away from the area you're trying to interrogate. So given that this patient is supine and this is the right side of the patient and this is the left side of the patient, then the patient needs to simply roll left side down, right side up, and that would shift the gas away from the bladder wall and you can interrogate the patient. Um, what we didn't know at the time is that the patient uh, self catheterizes to empty the bladder. And so this is simply introduced air in the bladder. It's really good to establish why it is that the gas is there because it could be introduced. It could be that the patient has emphysematous um, pyelonephritis and is very sick, or it could be that the patient has an enterovesical fistula, uh, for example, from um, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, here is a recent case that uh, had caused a bit of confusion to the sonographer and radiologist who uh, performed this examination. It's a, it's a patient being interrogated for deep vein thrombosis. You can see the vein is echo filled. The patient has a little bit of central venous hypertension, making it very difficult to compress peripheral veins. Um, also has a bit of pain, so they're reluctant to put up with it. So the sonographer was unable to compress and instead relied on color Doppler. And um, here in the femoral vein, so we have profunda femoris and femoral vein on top, we have an echo filled vein and a diagnosis of deep vein thrombosis was made. But um, if you could compress, which if the patient could tolerate it, um, you would see that these vessels are completely compressible. Uh, and so the artifact in question here is called a rouleau. A rouleau artifact is due to the fact that slow moving blood in veins sometimes uh, scatters enough that it becomes echogenic. And this is particularly uh, the case with newer and newer instruments that we're using there. They have higher and higher sensitivity. So we are actually seeing blood inside the patient. And blood can sometimes be very echogenic, particularly when it's slow because the red blood cells have a tendency to stack together like little magnets that creates a, a greater acoustic uh, impedance mismatch that creates a greater reflection. And that of course creates a greater echo, which in this case might be overriding uh, the color Doppler. For those of you who have a more sophisticated instrument, there is actually a control that tells the machine whether you prefer to see color or whether you tend to uh, want to see a B mode image. Uh, and that is called the color priority control. But about that, perhaps some other time uh, when we look at uh, Doppler artifacts. For now, uh, let's move to a conclusion. 
as you can see, ultrasound is highly prone to artifacts. No image is free from an artifact. And understanding the technology and artifact formation really allows the user to eliminate, avoid, or circumvent uh, some of these common artifacts. So I hope I've provided you with some strategies to do that. And ultimately, what we want to do is avoid diagnostic errors that can arise from incorrect identification of the artifacts. So uh, 